Morning. So uh, this is a brief chat on dorsal approach to the wrist. Uh, as in lots of hand and wrist surgery, it's actually relatively straightforward. Just basic anatomy and so the uh, return to basic anatomy is part of the talk. Indications. So there's several reasons to approach the wrist from the back rather than the front. Um, you can see uh, infection. It's a good reason to open the wrist joint, drain it either arthroscopic or open, uh, post-infection reconstruction. Uh, Transscaphoid perilunate dislocations or other major traumas to the wrist, wrist dislocations as discussed previously. See, uh, left of wrist arthritis, you can see a slack wrist top right. And then the more complex radiocarpal dislocations or distal radius fractures, really, which are radiocarpal dislocations with a fracture of the radiostyloid as opposed to a distal radius fracture. And finally, distal radius fractures, which require buttressing from behind as opposed to a volar locking plate. So the key to the back of the wrist is the extensive compartment. So it's worth just reminding ourselves about these in uh, plane section and cross section. So we can see uh, six compartments, and you'll all be familiar with these, um, running around the, the radial side of the wrist here, the first compartment, the abductor pollicis longus extensive brevis, the de Quervain's compartment. Underneath those, running distally to the second and third metacarpal bases, the extensive carpi radialis longus. And brevis, and you can see that where those two intersect just here, there may be an intersection syndrome. The third compartment, EPL, extensor pollicis longus running down, uh, which again intersects over the wrist extensors. And this forms the anatomic snuff box, which you know deep to this is where the scaphoid sits. EPL sits in its own compartment. You can see this diagram isn't perfect because, of course, Lister's tubercle is there on its radial side. There's not much of a tubercle on the ulnar side. Uh, EPR sits right next to the fourth compartment, which is the finger extensors. Uh, and then as you work ulnar, extensor digiti minimi has its own separate fifth compartment, the route to the distal radial ulnar joint. And finally, extensor carpi ulnaris over the ulnar in its own trochlear groove. So in MR, this is a T1, you can see those compartments very easily. The first, the second, EPL, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. The dorsal approaches to the wrist, we're going to raise various of these compartments up. If you're fixing a wrist fracture, you'll need to get to the back of the wrist. And so you'll need to raise up the fourth compartment and the interval between the first and second for your second column placing. They need to raise up this compartment. Whereas if you're going to do something to the back of the wrist joint itself, you'll need to raise the second and fourth. So depending what you're doing, you'll depend which of those tendons you might raise off the distal radius in the wrist capsule. The other thing to revise is the wrist ligament anatomy. So the way to think about these is a triangle apex triquetrum. And you can see we've got a diagram here. And these pictures, ideally all of the pictures I think have this, the uh, radial solid on the left-hand side, so it's a right wrist viewed from behind. There we are, you can see so this is tubercle and the dorsal distal radius with a radio uh, dorsal radiocarpal ligament, the DRC, which runs from the distal radius down to the triquetrum. From there, the dorsal intercarpal ligament runs from triquetrum back to trapezoid, and you can see that forms a triangle. Now, there's two sorts of capsulotomy. There'll be ligament sparing and ligament sacrificing capsulotomies. You can imagine if you want to do a wrist fusion and you just want to fuse the third ray to the capitate, to the lunate, to the radius, you'll just split these longitudinally, and that's not a problem because you're fusing the wrist. But if you want to do an operation where you preserve motion, so a four corner fusion, uh, scaphoid repair, scaphoid ligament repair, proximal row carpectomy, all of those you want to preserve motion. And so you're going to split the ligaments parallel with their fibers. And hence you might raise a triangular flap in line with this DRC and DIC ligaments. So landmarks, skin incision is always the same. It's focused on the listus tubercle. And if the listus is broken so bad you can't feel it, you have to kind of guess it's just slightly to the radial side of midline. But um, an incision based on listus tubercle and the focus of your incision longitudinally will be what you're trying to fix. So distal radial, the incision was slightly more proximal. If it's a carpal injury or a carpal reconstruction, the incision might be longer or more distal. A wrist fusion, you might involve both. First of all, we need to raise full thickness skin flaps, so superficial exposure. So leaving everything in their compartments, you'll raise skin and fat off the fascia, and you'll raise full thickness flaps in both directions. This is neat because as you run your knife along the fascia radially, you'll come to see the superficial radial nerve branches running 
in the undersurface of your fat so you can be sure that the uh, nerve is protected. And the bigger the exposure, the, um, the, the, the better you'll protect your, your nerve. On the ulnar side, the same thing, the uh, dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve runs on the ulnar side of your fascial flap. Having raised the skin flaps, you then need to identify where EPL is, and it depends how easy it is to find it, sometimes more distal, sometimes exactly at this tubercle, if there's a fracture and you can see a little brooch in the compartment, sometimes more proximal, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes the fascia is thicker, but at any rate, find EPL and release it, and release it all the way down distally, avoiding the superficial radial nerve, which branches will come over the roof of your incision, and then release it through the third compartment and radiate the uh, EPL tendon to the radial side, so you're in a reflected radial. Next move for all approaches is to raise the extensive digit uh, commonness from the radius and take it ulnar. So you can see you've got a periosteal elevation of sharp dissection to take the whole compartment off. It's important with EPL, you just raise that way, you can preserve the compartment floor. But with E4, you want to preserve the floor of the compartment as best as possible. Uh, to reduce the chance of adhesions of these tendons to the underlying bone and periosteal dissection. Uh, tenderness dissection is fine, but even better, subfascial dissection. Uh, and the hardest part of this is to dissect the E4 off the dorsal capsule because there is no plane. So you need to try to um, preserve those dorsal ligaments, which run, as you say, more or less transversely at the proximal part, at least, as they run across to the trichretrum preserve those ligaments without going too deep but at the same time not too superficial so you're leaving exposed tendons uh, which can then adhere to the capsulotomy subsequently. And the other thing is that the posterior interosseous nerve here we can see it here it's a beautiful description here PIN runs in the floor of the fourth compartment or in between three and just on the radial side of the floor of four and there are some approaches which preserve this uh, and some approaches which will sacrifice this but if you're doing a, a, a reconstruction for pain if you're doing a, a reconstruction for an infection, it may well be worth sacrificing this nerve and the associated tiny artery, uh, divide it approximately, so it's a fascia compartment top end uh, and, and not leave a painful neuroma. And in fact, if you want to do a neurectomy um, or a true denovation, you can denovate 90% of the wrist through just dividing the posterior interosseous nerve, plunging through the interosseous membrane just here, just proximal to the DIUJ, into the capsule, into the space between the two bones, and divide the anterior interosseous nerve on the opposite side that lies almost exactly deep to the PIN on the opposite side of the interosseous membrane. So dividing both nerves uh, in appropriate cases, entirely appropriate, uh, and will give the patient good pain relief. So this is the ligament sparing capsulotomy described by Richard Berger from America, uh, the Berger capsulotomy. So you decide on exactly where, how far radial you need to see, if you need to see a long way radial, you'll take your radial flap along the line of the radial carpal joint. At any rate, the incision in the, in the ligaments is trying to preserve a cuff of tissue on either side. So kind of more or less central in the dorsal radial carpal ligament, apex trichretrum, a fairly blunt apex, so you can reattach this to the trichretrum and then run it distally and radially again in the dorsal intercarpal ligament to raise your chevron capsule flap. You can, as I say, run it along the radius. And if you do this, you need to use some suture anchors to, to repair it back on. But you'll get a most fantastic view. Here's a picture from an instructional video, just a screenshot to show that. And you can see that these are the, 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 the uh, lines they've drawn. This is distal radius here. This is the proximal carpal row here. And this is capitate uh, and hamate just poking in over here. So you can see. The other thing that's really interesting about this photograph, and we'll come to this in just a moment, is the dorsal ridge. So this is scaphoid, scapholunate ligament, and lunate. And the lunate always sits more ulnar than you think. The scapholunate ligament sits directly underneath the head of the capitate. So SL ligament here, lunate there. And this is the dorsal ridge of the scaphoid. And you see how far ulnar that runs. In fact, it runs to the tip of the scaphoid. Now, this is how the blood gets into the scaphoid. So the next slide uh, just shows this in greater depth. Dorsal ridge runs along the entire length of the scaphoid. Of course, the implication for that is gonna be vascularity for fractures. If you ask medical students, um, what's the main problem with scaphoid fracture? They'll almost instinctively say avascular necrosis. This is clearly wrong, because even fractures uh, quite proximal in the scaphoid are not gonna cause AVN. 
but just note this dorsal ridge, which is continuous along the carpus. All the way the ligament around the back of the lunate, the dorsal ridge of lunate, and onto triquetry. And all this needs to be raised off your burger capsulostomy in order for you to see what you need to see in the dorsal carpus. So vascularity post scaphoid fracture. So you can see clearly this left-hand scaphoid waist fracture will be proximal vascularity is preserved. And even this proximal third fracture, vascularity is still preserved. So why do proximal third non-unions get avascular necrosis? Not because of immediate thrombosis of these vessels, but because of non-union. So with non-union of this fracture in the center, there will be gradual attrition of these final few nutrient vessels running through these nutrient foramina here. And so non-union has a higher rate of avascular necrosis if it's in the proximal third. But an acute fracture, the proximal third will still be vascularized. And therefore, um, if it requires fixation, will will almost certainly heal once it's been fixed and undergo, uh, very rarely to undergo AVN. Proximal fifth fractures, as you can see on the right, there's almost no soft tissue attachment apart from the scaphoid ligament. These are the ones which are very likely to undergo primary AVN. And so these fractures almost always need fixation. Fractures in the proximal fifth, mainly to restore vascularity of the proximal uh, fifth fragment through endo or endostial uh, blood circulation, creeping substitution. So these ones, uh, I should say, probably never undergo AVN. These ones rarely undergo AVN except for non-union, but these ones will often undergo AVN, if not always. So just again on scaphoid non-union, because it's an important topic, I appreciate the uh, dorsal approach. The wrist is fairly straightforward. So scaphoid non-union, we need to see a lateral reconstruction CT or, or tomogram. We need to see how much flexion um, there may be or how much displacement. So this fracture on the left, uh, provided the fracture gap is less than two millimeters, is very likely to go on to heal. Whereas the fracture on the right, which is flexed, uh, has less stability. They can see dorsal ridge here. But the flexion gap has opened up by more than two millimeters. And this in Stability is like the cause of non-union. Stability is the number one cause for scaphoid non-union. Vascularity is less of an issue acutely and even less of an issue in terms of non-union. So in terms of vascular reconstruction, it's relatively rare to require vascular reconstruction for scaphoid non-union. Almost invariably, if you can restore stability, you will achieve union. But in summary, for the dorsal approach to the wrist, and we'll just run through the steps again. So a skin incision based on Lister's tubercle, the length determined by what you intend to do, uh, suprafascial flaps preserving the superficial radial nerve and the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve, find the EPL, raise it from its compartment and reflect it radially, and then find extensor digiti communis uh, and reflect that ulna, trying to maintain it within its own fascial envelope, which is particularly difficult over the wrist joint, but easier over the radius. Consider whether to do a pinurectomy, then decide whether to raise ECR LMB from there uh, to shoot bed if you're doing a wrist reconstruction or if you're doing a distorted fracture fixation, you might leave them in their bed and find the one two interval. For the capsulotomy, do a burger flap, which is uh, ligament preserving, uh, and raise the capsule off the dorsal ridge of the proximal carpal row, exposing these, achieve your aim, and then uh, repair with a maximum uh, chance of preservation of motion at the end.